So you've thought about it for months, and you've been pushing your editors and your sources um, for an opportunity to interview the big guy. And now it's a reality, an interview with the President of the United States. But what's the goal, and how do you prepare? We're extremely fortunate to have two guests who know a little something about the strategy involved in landing the rarest of gets and then delivering. George Condon, over here, is the National Journal's White House correspondent during a decorated career in Washington, including stints at Congressional or Congress Daily and Bureau Chief for Copley News Service and the San Diego Tribune. George has interviewed 10 presidents, is that right? He also led the team that won the 2006 Pulitzer Prize for reporting that sent a California congressman to prison. George is a past president of the White House Correspondents Association and the Gridiron Club. We are also proud to say that George also served as a past chairman of the National Press Foundation. Rashad Hudson is a Washington correspondent for the Next Star Media Group. Arriving in D.C. in 2020 from Alabama, where he covered the state capitol for Birmingham CBS affiliate. He also is a 22, or I'm sorry, 2022 alum of your group, the Paul Miller Fellowship, um, where he scored a rare interview uh, with President Biden while he was in the class. Um, so if a presidential interview is something that you aspire to, you can do it from right here. So uh, please welcome our, our guest today. And I'll turn it over to George first, and then we'll corral Rashad. Although I do notice that you put National Journal in the back row here. So Well, you're know. welcome to come straight up uh, that's front. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> well, we've got two of you in the room now, so we're, that's true. That's we've true. reached capacity. So, um, the... Uh, I always thought Paul Miller was, was a great program. Uh, I, I actually uh, met Paul Miller. Uh, our time in the Gridiron Club overlapped by three years before he died, but uh, he, he would be very happy at seeing uh, this program today. Um, I, I was looking through uh, all your bios uh, last night, and I saw uh, one, one quote uh, from one of you uh, about interviews. Uh, uh, Neri Patani, ah, okay. You, you said, uh, with each new interview and each new story, I become a student again. And that, that's a perfect capture of, of what you're trying to do with an interview. You're not trying to show how smart you are uh, or do gotcha. Uh, you're trying to learn things, and, and, it's, and it's fun. That's, that's actually what's fun about interviews. Let me give you a little background on, on interviews with presidents. They used to be extraordinarily unusual to the point where, uh, actually let me, can we hand these out? Uh, okay. uh, the first three interviews with presidents ended up giving the reporters Pulitzer Prizes just for getting the interview, forget uh, what was in there. Uh, and, and that's especially remarkable because the very first one in 1921, Louis Siebold of the New York World got an interview with President Wilson, who had just had a stroke the year before. And he won the Pulitzer, but the entire interview was a lie. It was complete false. Uh, the president's wife, the first lady, wanted to persuade the Democrats to nominate Wilson for a third term at the convention. And she wanted an interview to show that he, how vigorous and healthy he was, which was a complete lie. He was paralyzed on one side, uh, was slurring his words, had an attention span of about 60 seconds. Uh, but in his interview, uh, Louis Siebold said, uh, let's see, uh, how delighted he was to find the president almost his old self. He joshed with him about running a foot race in a month or two and would give the president a little handicap because he might limp a little. Uh, 
He, he claimed that he watched Wilson sign a document with the same copper plate signature, when in fact his signature then was an indecipherable scribble. Um, and he maintained uh, that he had a hard time keeping up uh, with Wilson. Not a word in that interview was true, but he, he got the Pulitzer Prize. Then the next time, Arthur Crock of the New York Times got an interview with FDR in 1937. Uh, and that was so unusual, the White House Correspondents Association went to Wilson that week, uh, Wilson, went to FDR that week and bitterly complained and demanded that FDR promise never to give another interview. Uh, and Will, uh, the, well, Roosevelt agreed, apologized for giving the interview, uh, and did not give another interview as president. Uh, the, uh, but Kroc got a Pulitzer. When Harry Truman became president, Arthur Kroc got an interview with him and won another Pulitzer for it. And this time the correspondence again went to uh, the president and demanded that he not do that. You have to share, you have to treat everybody equally. Uh, Truman, though, did not apologize. Truman told him to go to hell. Uh, you know, he was going to give an interview to anybody he wanted to at any time. And ever since then, interviews have become more standard. Uh, to give you an idea of how standard, here's, uh, this, Martha Kumar is a, uh, is an absolute gem. She's a uh, emeritus professor at Towson University, and she's down there in the White House basement with us almost every day at every briefing. Uh, and she keeps just meticulous track of who gets interviews, what presidents do, how they communicate, press conferences. And if you look at that, you'll see that Biden has given, what was it, uh, 86 interviews so far. Now, I, could not, I, I couldn't get in touch with Martha this morning because I wanted to be able to say who had gotten them because it's not like the old days where regional newspapers uh, or the big papers like the Times and the Post got most of the interviews. Now a number of those interviews are, are with uh, TikTok and uh, you know, uh, podcasters uh, and so on. And so, uh, President Biden has not been real uh, generous in his, in his interviews. Uh, and, the, and you see they do not compare well with, uh, with other presidents. But let, let me give some examples of, of how you can do interviews and, uh, and what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and I'll, I'll do that by looking at some of my interviews. Uh, I, I suppose my first one, uh, I, don't sure, I don't think it counts because I didn't know I was interviewing a president. Uh, when I was a freshman at Georgetown and writing for the Hoya, uh, I, had a, I did a football story, uh, interviewed the head of the Student Athletic Commission, a, an upperclassman named Bill Clinton. Uh, and Clinton had uh, this wonderful idea. Nobody believed that Georgetown had football, uh, and we were upgrading the program. And he brought back on campus the uh, members of the uh, Georgetown football team back when Georgetown was called an Eastern football power. Uh, then they played in the 1941 Orange Bowl against Mississippi, uh, and he brought them back on campus. And that was, it was a, like a memorable three paragraph story. Uh, and I thought that was it. You know, Clinton was a big deal on campus. I was a nobody freshman. No reason for him to remember me. I saw him 15 years later when I was covering a national governor's conference and he was governor of Arkansas and he remembered my name. Now that that's, tells you a lot about uh, his memory. Um, the, uh, the interview that sticks in my mind was my worst interview, probably my worst mistake as a, a journalist. And I'm convinced that you remember your worst moments much more than you do the the good ones, and you, and you better learn from them. Uh, and my, my worst one came on uh, August 8, 1996. And let me, let me give you uh, the president's schedule from that day. OK. 
just to show you where the interview was supposed to fit in. Uh, the, it is traditional, or at least it was then, when you're the host newspaper for a political convention, you get interviews with both the nominees. Uh, and we were the host paper at San Diego Union Tribune for the Republican convention in 96. So Mark Baerbeck, who's now with the LA Times, got an interview with Bob Dole, and I had an interview with the president. And I was meeting him in San Jose, and I would fly with him on Air Force One to Los Angeles. And I saw the schedule set an hour and 10 minutes, and they led me to believe I had plenty of time. The point of the interview was to get him to talk about Bob Dole and the campaign. But I stupidly thought, well, why don't I ask one substantive policy question to begin? And then I'll do the politics. So we cared in San Diego about the border, and I asked him a border question. And the president said, let me make six points about that. And then started talking and talking. And the clock is ticking away. He was only at point three. And I, I was wondering, can you interrupt the president of the United States and say, I'll stipulate to the last three? Uh, and I decided you probably couldn't do that. And finally, mercifully, he came to the end of his six points, and I could get into the politics when Leon Panetta, the chief of staff, said, well, we've got to end this. Uh, the president's tired. Uh, and I had not asked a single question on what the point of the story was. I managed to, to jam in two quick ones and then work the phones after that, so you couldn't tell by the story. But that was incredibly stupid on my part. If you have something you want to ask the president, ask him. You don't know how long these are going to last. And I, you know, I looked at that schedule and I saw an hour and 10 minutes. I should have looked at the fuller schedule, which told me, I have it here somewhere. Uh, maybe I don't. But the, the president had his day that day went from 8.30 a.m. until midnight. It had eight motorcades. Uh, one Air Force One thing, uh, five Marine One stops, and multiple stops ending with the uh, fundraiser with, uh, with Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, he was tired. It was a grueling day, and I should, have, uh, I should have recognized that. So I have not made that mistake again. Let me, let me go from there to what was my best interview. Uh, that was October 5th, 1993, uh, with Clinton, again with, Clint, uh, with Clinton. But the night before, well, it was supposed to be about NAFTA, and it was, it was going to be in the uh, limousine, in the, uh, the beast, is what they call it. Uh, and it was during the NAFTA debate, and I wanted to uh, talk to him about NAFTA. But the night before, uh, there, there used to be a show called Nightline with Ted Koppel. And uh, Koppel showed these just riveting uh, TV pictures from Somalia. Uh, it became known as Black Hawk Down later when a movie was made of it. But it was a, a, an ambush on American troops. And the rebels, after killing them, uh, dragged uh, the soldiers' bodies through the streets of Mogadishu and then strung the bodies up on the bridge. Uh, it, was, it was TV pictures that, that that's all anybody was talking about. And even though I wanted to talk about NAFTA, you have to adjust to the news. And the president was not taking any questions from anybody and had not reacted to that. So the only chance to get his reaction was my interview. Uh, so I, I dropped the NAFTA things, and we just talked about that. And it ended up making news that, that all the networks, everybody had to pick up on because it was his only reaction. And then uh, when we got to the uh, Air Force One and his aides are trying to get him out of the car, I said to him, I, I wish we had had time to talk about NAFTA. And he said, I want to talk about NAFTA. And he kept me in the car, much to his aide's unhappiness and delaying the takeoff of Air Force One, 
for 15 minutes talking about NAFTA. So it was, it was a win-win. I had made news with uh, Mogadishu and, uh, and got what I wanted on NAFTA. Now, then there's my oddest interview with the president, and that was April 1986 with Reagan. Uh, and they were looking for all different ways of interacting with the press and improving his press. And they tried this time to do, they wanted to do a casual one. So uh, there's a great room in the basement of the library, uh, basement of the White House, the library. And they gathered uh, about six of us down there. And, and Reagan, to show it was casual, uh, was drinking a screwdriver and offered us drinks. But one lesson of you don't take a drink at a, <laughs> when you're interviewing the president. So none of us uh, accepted. But he was drinking. And uh, one of the reporters, Dave Hassan McClatchy, uh, was hard of hearing. And he sat down next to the president uh, and said to him, you know, I'm sitting next to you because I'm hard of hearing. Well, Reagan brightened because Reagan had hurt his hearing uh, in one of the movies that, that he did where they shot a prop gun right next to his ear. And so he wore a hearing aid, and he wanted to sell that hearing aid to Dave. So he took it out of his ear and gave it to Dave and said, now here's the benefits of that, and I have different ones. And he said, here, show it to everybody. So they passed the president's hearing aid around to each of us, and none of us wanted his hearing aid in their hand. But he's president of the United States, so I admired the hearing aid and, and, and passed it on. But that, that, that was the oddest. Uh, um, my most constructive was also with Reagan, and that was May 4th, 1983. Uh, and I learned an important lesson about presidential interviews. Again, they were looking for different ways of getting Reagan with the press. So they had six of us. Uh, it was a, a reporter from the Dallas Morning News, U.S. News and World Report, New York Daily News, uh, Chris Wallace of NBC, and Steve Wiseman in the New York Times. Six of us, 30-minute interview in the Oval Office. But they were piping it out to the briefing room. So anybody in the briefing room could hear the interview. Um, and we actually didn't know that, and it's never been done before or since, uh, and you'll see why. Uh, when you're sitting there in the Oval Office, uh, you are thinking of your next question. You're thinking of, of what you want to get out of it. You don't always listen as well as you should. The people sitting in the briefing room didn't have that on their mind. They were just listening to the questions and decided that Reagan was so off his game that day that Lou Cannon of the Washington Post, who had covered him going back to before he was governor, wrote a story in the Post suggesting that Reagan was, uh, his mental acuity was not there. Can you imagine saying that about a president? But, uh, uh, and questioning whether his age had gotten to him uh, and affecting him. But we realized, those of the six of us who were in the Oval Office, that we weren't listening as closely as that. That had not hit, not a single one of us in the room thought that Reagan had a bad day. Uh, but everybody listening in, in the briefing room uh, did. Uh, so that was the oddest. But it, 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 it taught me to definitely listen uh, to the answers. Uh, and let me, let me uh, close with, uh, I, I talked to uh, Steve Holland last night uh, of Reuters, who's covered uh, the White House uh, quite a long time and because of working for Reuters, has had uh, a lot of interviews. And, and we sort of put together uh, the Ten Commandments of, of interviewing a president. Uh, but to preface that, there's also the reminder that, you know, Michael Douglas in, uh, in the movie The American President had one line where he said, uh, the Oval Office is the greatest home field advantage in the Western world. Uh, that's true. And it's also true of, uh, I've had interviews on Air Force One, in the limo, Roosevelt Room, and so on. It's true. There's a great <clears throat> home field advantage. There's something intimidating there. And, and Steve learned in one of his, his first interview with Reagan, in the, with uh, Trump in the Oval Office, uh, Trump 
offered them, anybody want a Diet Coke, soft drink, anything? And uh, they, they said no. Uh, but then Trump reached over and he had this red button on his desk. And he, and he went to press it. And Steve, not thinking Trump, red button, Oval Office, that's not a good combination. Uh, and he said, don't push that. And, and the president then explained that that was a button he had had installed uh, to get Diet Coke because he wanted a constant supply of, of Diet Coke. Uh, but it's still not, it's a little unnerving to see a president, especially Trump, pushing uh, the red button. Um, but let me go through here. I really had this. Uh, so the, the, the sort of 10 things that Steve and I came up with last night uh, was be prepared before you go in there. Read up on the topics you're going to ask about and know what the president has said before. Uh, and then this one is particularly uh, one of my pet peeves. Ask short questions. It, it just drives me crazy that so many reporters give speeches or ask 10-part questions. That is always a mistake. Uh, it gives the president a time to think and craft, you know, uh, you know not real, not very genuine answer. And you don't get his initial impulse, which is usually the truth. It'll, and it allows him to pick and choose one part of your, your question. And I know why people do that, because we've heard a president give his standard answer, and you want to try to head that off. But it doesn't work. You ask a short declarative question. Um, and then frame the questions in such a way as to generate news. You know, gotcha questions might make you feel good, but they really don't elicit useful information. And, and if that's all you're going to ask, you're not going to get a second interview. Uh, use it to get news. Um, this next one is, 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 I sort of mentioned already, listen carefully to the answers and ask follow-ups when warranted or when you don't understand something. People sometimes are afraid to say they didn't understand it. Uh, and I've, one of my biggest frustrations as a uh, reporter is when I'm transcribing a tape of one of my interviews and I hear myself ignore an obvious follow-up where the president says, or anybody, says something that's newsworthy and I don't jump on it and ask the follow-up and I just go on to my next question because I, that's what I was thinking of. Um, and, and you also have to be prepared to break in when presidents start filibustering or, or drifting. Uh, Obama was particularly tough to interrupt because he, he, he gave long answers. Um, and then the lesson of my convention interview, ask what you care about most, the first. And Steve gave me an example. When Reuters interviewed Trump on the phone last April, uh, Steve made sure he got his foreign policy stuff that he wanted in first. And it paid off because later, when they started asking about his legal problems, Trump got furious and hung up on him. So if he had held his foreign policy questions for after the legal, he wouldn't have gotten them in. Uh, and the other, and this was something I didn't do on the Air Force One, pay attention to how much time you have. If they give you 15 minutes, keep an eye on the clock and cover what you need in the time allowed. Th this can be difficult, but uh, you know, I remember a time where put you in front of the president and say you have five minutes, and it's amazing you'll learn how much you can cover in, in five minutes. Uh, and this one Steve added, have fun. Uh, if you've covered all that you want to cover, save some kind of fun question uh, for the end. It might be about sports or, or whatever. Uh, and then once Steve and I both agreed on this, use two recording devices. I'd never go in to interview a president with one tape recorder. And uh, uh, you do not want to get out of there and discover that it, it malfunctioned and you don't have any of it. Um, and then uh, uh, be professional and respectful. You know, we're not there as, as tourists. Uh, don't ask for pictures or favors or souvenirs. Uh, thank them for the time afterwards. And I'll, I'll give you an example of one professional. When we were in the uh, library with uh, Reagan, one of the reporters, and I won't name her, um, said to the president, 
My mother wants to know why you never call on me at your press conferences. And it, it, it flustered Reagan, and he told his chief of staff, make sure I call on her next time. And then at the next press conference, she was seated in the first row, but everybody knew that Reagan's favorite color, or Nancy's favorite color, was red, and that he tended to call on people wearing red ties, or the women wore red dresses, and so on. But this particular reporter showed up at the East Room for a, white, a prime time press conference uh, wearing red mittens. Uh, I got to, that ain't professional. Uh, so, and then the, the final one from Steve, I'll read. He said, your bosses may insist on offering you several questions and they may be too long-winded. If you use them, rewrite them to a more conversational style. So anyway, hope I didn't take up too much time. So, there you go. Thank you so much. What a wealth of knowledge. Um, I've only had one interview with the president, but this is, this is really good information because I was taking notes for if I get the chance to interview him again. Hi, I'm Rashad. I'm with Nexstar Media Group. Uh, on the TV side, um, Nexstar has 115 television stations across the country. Um, the way our office kind of operates, we divide up the country. There's about seven of us. Uh, I cover the Midwest. Um, and I kind of want to go through just the background of how I was able to interview President Biden. Um, I got a chance to interview the president in Syracuse, New York, uh, back in 2020. It was in October of 2020, two weeks before the midterm elections. So. I didn't actually want, I wasn't reaching out to the White House to interview the president. This started in 2022, it was in February of 2022. I had a chance to interview the vice president in January to talk about their one year uh, of the administration, to talk about their accomplishments, what they'd like to do going forward. And there were a lot of questions that I didn't get to ask the vice president from that earlier interview. So I reached out to the vice president's office in February saying, hey, I would like to do a follow-up interview with the vice president. Um, does she have time in her schedule? And of course, they turned me down. And I reached out again in March, April. I reached out until about August. And I stopped re reaching out because I got tired of getting turned down um, for interviews. But the idea of trying to interview the vice president was, you know, she's a rising star in the Democratic Party. Many people think that you know, someday she'll become president, um, run for the office herself. So it's like, you know, the American people should get to know the vice president. Um, I thought I would have easier access to her office, but turns out that wasn't the case. So I stopped reaching out in August of 2022, and my contact with the vice president's office left to go work for the president. So I stopped reaching out for two months, and in October I get a call from my contact, and he's like, hey, I know you've been trying to interview the vice president, um, but I have someone better. And I was like, who could that be? Not thinking, you know, the president. I was like, who could that be? And he was like, I can get you the, the big guy. And I was like, the big guy? He was like, yeah, the big guy. And he was like, this was on a Tuesday. He was like, if you can, the president has seven minutes in his schedule in Syracuse, New York, where he's going to be talking about um, economic development. Micron had just opened, announced they were investing hundreds of millions of dollars in Syracuse. So the White House said, if you can fly up to Syracuse, we have seven minutes available for the president. This was on a Tuesday. Talked to my boss about it. Me and a photographer got on a plane and on Wednesday and flew up to Syracuse. And so we get there and the interviews going to be at a community college. Uh, they had the classroom set up for the interview. Uh, we were working with the advanced team. Now, we arrived at this community college at 8 a.m. and the interview wasn't scheduled until 4.15 p.m. But of course, whenever you're interviewing the president, you have camera equipment, you have to go through the Secret Service suite. So that took several hours. We had to leave the room and then, set it, then we got back in the room, set up our cameras and lights and we did mock, sort of mock interviews with the staff uh, because they wanted to check the lighting. Of course, they want to make sure that their boss looks good on TV, sounds good, everything is flawless. So we do that, and uh, that takes a long time because they're adjusting lighting, uh, different positions for the president to stand. I mean, it was a well-oiled machine that travels with the president and making sure that the president, um, you know, everything is perfect for the president. And so we go through that, and it's starting to get to four, it hits four o'clock. The president's still on stage talking about 
um, you know, the Micron coming to Syracuse, how great of an investment this is for that community. And then 30 minutes go by, we reach an hour, an hour and a half, and I'm worried that the president's gonna cancel. I'm like, maybe there's a national security emergency, he's gonna have to cancel. And I was like, we've promised this interview to all 115 of our television stations. You know, what are we going to do? But we had already handed over the microphone to uh, someone on the president's staff because we, they wanted him mic'd up when he walks in the room. They didn't want to waste any time because we only had seven minutes with him. So then 6.15 comes around and the president's mic'd up and we're list you could hear him walking down the hall and they're like prepping him on the interview about the topics, telling him my name. And then the president walks in the room and he says, hello Rashad, good to see you. And uh, he starts talking and the president, I don't know if you've guys, if you've had a chance to be around him, um, he's very personable, at least that was my experience with him, and he wanted to just talk about the day and what was going on. I was like, oh, Mr. President, what's it like to be back in Syracuse, New York, because he went to law school there. And then I also learned that his uh, first wife that uh, passed away, she's buried in Syracuse, so he talked about that. He was in a really good mood that day. Um, I'm not sure why, but he was in a very good mood. Um, he had just gotten some good numbers um, when it relates to the GDP, because that was my first question. Um, so we start the interview, I had to like sort of, not really cut him off, but interrupt him a little when he was st starting with the small talk. I was like, all right, Mr. President, we'll go ahead and get started, because by then I had five minutes left in the interview, and I had about 10 questions, but of course I didn't get to all 10 of the questions. So then we start the interview, he starts talking, and at some point I'm like, okay, I gotta jump in here, because I'm, I'm watching the clock. Mind you, there's about 40 people that work for the president to my right in the room. This was a room about the size of this room. And there's about 40 people that work for the president, from the press secretary, the communications director, um, several press assistants, the trip director, the deputy chief of staff, uh, tons of people in the room. And I'm looking around, trying to gauge time, and so he starts talking, and I'm trying to jump in there to get a question, and he finishes, and then I'm like, okay, then I go to my next question, keep a asking him questions. And one of the things I took away from what you talked about was don't be afraid to interrupt the president to do a follow-up, because I'm, I was focused on my questions that I had prepared, not really listening, thinking, oh, this is a good chance for a follow-up, because there were two really important follow-ups that I missed in that interview looking back. One of them was, he talked about the GDP and all that. To most Americans at home, they're like, what is that? Sure, they know what it is, but you know, if it's good or bad, it, they're wondering how does it affect their life? And so that was kind of a follow-up that I missed. Also, another follow-up was on the term act, because he got into the midterm elections. Another follow-up that I missed was, uh, when the president arrived in Syracuse, he was greeted by Senator Schumer, senator from New York, and Schumer was sort of called on a hot mic saying that we're in trouble in Georgia. This was during the uh, Georgia elections against, um, with Senator Warnock. And he was sort of called on a hot mic, Schumer saying, Mr. President, we're sort of in trouble in Georgia. And I, would, I had that question prepared, but somehow didn't get a chance to sort of, because that was news of the day, hot mic moment. It was recorded, the pool cameras had it, uh, papers were writing about it. Um, sort of a missed follow-up sort of news of the day moment. Um, I wish I could have, I should have pulled up the interview, but if you get a chance, just go to YouTube and type in uh, Rashad Hudson, President Biden interview, and it should pop up. Um, but we do the interview, I thought it went well, um, but they did short me on two minutes just because I only got five minutes with the president. Um, and just some of the things I uh, took away from that interview was you really have to study how the person performs in previous interviews. And President Biden is sort of, um, you sort of have to match their energy. Like President Biden doesn't give long answers sometimes. So you have to, as um, was mentioned earlier, you have to kind of give short, short questions um, to make sure that you have time. And with TV, the package is a minute 30. So we don't have a lot of time to, you know, try to do long interviews and do long, uh, answers, but just kind of studying how the person has performed in other, in other interviews to match their energy. Also, the president isn't a fast talker. So like the questions, I made sure to slow down the questions to make sure that, you know, they were, he could understand them and I could get a good answer out of them because 
um, if he didn't understand the question, there was no way I was going to get a good answer from him. And the other thing I would give you is always look for those news of the day questions. Like I had, like if I were to interview the president right now, I have questions that I would ask. But you always want to uh, focus on those news of the day questions. And like was mentioned, less of the got you questions, but just sort of stay with the news of the day questions. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to take your questions. Is it? Sure, we, we can open it up. I, I, I just want to go to George once because Rashad talked about how he landed his interview with, with Biden, um, pestering the vice president's office. How Can you uh, describe how you went about getting your interviews and, and getting them to agree? Um, I mean, the, the, it, it's always different. It, it, the, the important thing is what audience the, way the president wants to uh, reach. You're, you're, you're never going to get an interview because you have a winning personality. They do it because it's for them. And when I worked for the San Diego uh, paper, they could reach California. This is back when California was actually a competitive state. In fact, it was the state Democrats were trying to flip. It had been part of the Republican electoral uh, lock if you can imagine that now. Uh, and, you know, San Diego is one of the biggest cities, and we reached also Los Angeles. So that's why they did it there. Uh, and, and with Reagan, they also had a preference for California papers. Uh, in, in all cases, that's what it is. Uh, what's different now and works against me uh, is that the demise of, uh, of regional newspapers in the country. Uh, it makes a White House much less interested in reaching us. I mean, uh, Obama, uh, I believe, never gave an interview uh, to the Chicago Sun-Times, his hometown paper. He gave one interview to the Chicago Tribune. That would have been unheard of <clears throat> in an earlier uh, time. I mean, Reagan talked to the Los Angeles Times repeatedly. Uh, Trump, uh, even though he hates the New York Times, uh, has always wanted their approval. Uh, and so he will curse Maggie Haberman, uh, but then call her uh, with things. It, it, it was a very strange, uh, he always wants the approval of Manhattan, even while he's criticizing Manhattan. Um, it's, it's, uh, that's, that's why you see more interviews now, not with newspapers, uh, but with uh, smaller niche outlets and so on. So it's just, you let them know you're there, you're interested. Everybody's interested in it. That, that's not news to them. But it, hopefully be in a place where they get something out of it. Right. Hi there. Uh, my name is Mike Vasoli with the Associated Press. Um, my question for you is, you know, you talked a little bit about those moments of filibustering, if you will. But adjacent to that, what do you do, how do you respond when you're talking to the president or someone higher in government who seems to be sticking to the script, if that's the right words for it, where you feel like you're maybe you're not getting the most genuine, genuine or illuminating answers, but it's you you feel like you're being. Fed in in other words, every president. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, follow up questions. How you phrase the question. You know, I I could sit here right now and tell you how Biden is going to answer just about every question, because I've heard him uh, so many times. But you take a little bit different angle and follow-up question. That, that there's no better thing than a follow-up question to get him off of the talking points. I remember, I remember a reporter, Re Ronald Reagan had his own talking points about Martin Luther King when we were uh, debating whether it would become a holiday. Uh, and most of the questions to Reagan on Martin Luther King were, were not good questions. You got the standard answer. Uh, one reporter, and I couldn't find it last night, I looked for it, uh, asked him just a, what's your, what was your view of Martin Luther King? Just a quick, uh, short question, and Reagan didn't have time to give his, his, his usual answer. And I, I couldn't find it, so, but... Uh, that, that always works. Hi, my name is Anari. I'm with uh, KFF Health News. 
My question is not about interviewing presidents, but more generally often um, elected officials, people in uh, governmental positions of power. Uh, to both of your points about kind of prioritizing the information you want most at, at the top of the interview, I've found sometimes when I've been doing more investigative type stories where we find some sort of you know lack of oversight from a state agency or something critical about them, when those interviews are set up, I have a very critical question to ask the person. Essentially, you know, your department had this failure that caused, led to this human harm. I'm often reluctant to start out like that is my most important question, but I don't want to start the interview with that question. Because well, but the, but I think presidents are different on that. When the people you're interviewing are not likely to uh, say you only have seven minutes. Uh, I've, I've never done an interview with somebody other than a president where they said we're going to keep you to five minutes. If they told you that, you'd tell them, you know, go to hell. I'm not going to, you know, I, I need this much time. Mm -hmm. And you've set that up beforehand. You're not talking about uh, an interview where somebody, a member of Congress, is walking down the hallway. You're talking about a, a preset interview. Yeah. So yeah, you can go about that a different way. You can plan it, and you know, don't make your first question, uh, "Did you kill your wife?" Uh, so, so, so in that case, you would would ease right, into it. Right, right. You have more. You have more time to play with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right, right. We'll start here and then we'll go down. Hi, guys. One thing that I noticed from the papers that you passed around, by the way, thank you for. There'll be a us. quiz later. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but that it has the, the interview with you and your name and your news service on the schedule. Right. That is something I've never seen under President Biden. If he does an interview, maybe they'll tell us, like, while it's happening or a few minutes before it started. I don't know if you remember, but well, did I don't that think, but I don't think that's the schedule that they put out to the public. Oh. That was the internal schedule that you can get from the library uh, now. So, okay, so wow. So yeah, you, you're you're still. I mean, every president is a little bit different in yeah. how what they put on the public schedule. The most famous or infamous was after Trump lost uh, re-election. Uh, he was he did nothing. There was nothing on his public schedule. And that would say that. The president has no public events. Well, he was furious at his staff for that and ordered them to put on his schedule, the president has many meetings and, uh, and, and phone calls during the day and is always working. <laughs> it was just the most bizarre thing. But uh, so, yeah, don't trust the public schedule always. OK. Well, that changes my question a bit, but I guess, like, did you tell your colleagues that you were getting an interview with the president yeah, that yeah, day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only time you don't, you have to keep, I mean, you don't really broadcast it uh, because they're going to, you don't want them going to the press secretary and saying, how come he's getting an interview and I'm not? But it, it wasn't a big secret. Uh, if you're in a situation, I, I went to, after, uh, in December of 1992, President Bush went to uh, Somalia. Uh, and that was something that, I, it was a war zone then. And I could not tell anyone. I couldn't tell uh, even my editors. Uh, because that would endanger the security uh, of, you know, Air Force One landing in a war zone. You don't want that out. So when we go to Iraq or, or any place like that, you have to keep that secret. And just to kind of chime in for my interview, we did tell the stations, but only certain people at our affiliates about the interview. I didn't really tell many of my colleagues. They just knew I was going to Syracuse, New York, but they weren't sure exactly why. Um, we didn't tell them until we landed because we wanted to make sure that, you know, we were actually going to get the interview. It was less about security. It was more about we didn't want to promise, you know, the stations and the, um, people around the people at our stations this interview that you know may or may not happen so that was our reason for like sort of you know telling select people I remember your interview because I had to watch it <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean you wrote up <laughs> wanted no, 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 but I wrote it up but I just I guess I wonder you didn't even ask for that interview you just kind of like found out you were going to do it within like a very short amount of time like how did you deal with 
the nerves like leading up to it and then also just like in the moment of you have seven minutes to interview the president. So in the back of my mind, I kept thinking they were gonna cancel, so that's why I wasn't like super nervous because I didn't think it was actually going to happen. We were two hours late for this interview and then I had to go live at 6.30 to talk about what we just interviewed about and I was like, well, I'm not gonna have anything to talk about on TV. I'm gonna have to go on and say that the president canceled, which I don't wanna say that, so I kept thinking that it wasn't going to happen. And then, you know, he walks in the room, shakes my hand, and I was like, oh boy, this is it. Um, I guess in the moment, like once, you know, as reporters, once we turn it on, I think we sort of lose the nerves. Like leading up to it and the buildup, there's, you know, there's always the nerves. But once you turn it on and start asking the questions and really get into the conversation, you sort of, you're, you're sort of in your zone and your element. All right. Hi. Diego from Bloomberg. Um, I wanted to talk about that, ask about the intimidation factor um, that, George, you mentioned the being the beast in the Oval Office, um, in the Air Force One. Was Is there a particular place that's more intimidating to be at, and how do you overcome that intimidation? And Risha, sorry? Rashad. Rashad. Um, for you, how was it like you were on camera? So, you know, how do you overcome that being on camera? Um, so, for me, it was both of our, we were sort of in a neutral zone. So, that was the lucky part. So, we weren't at the White House. We were at a community college in a random tiny classroom. So, we, there was no home field advantage. I had been there longer, so I felt like I had a little more of an advantage than the president. Um, but I, I wasn't as intimidated because I, I kind of wanted to match his energy. I kind of wanted to sort of vibe, you know, if he was going to, you know, really be intense with the answer, I wanted to be intense with the question. If he was relaxed, I wanted to be relaxed. So just, I guess, sort of just matching his energy is what helped me. Yeah, I, I, I don't think you, you lose it, though. Uh, I mean, I've, the first time I was in the Oval Office, uh, was 1982, and the most recent was a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it it doesn't change. You're, it's it's still intimidating. It's still if you are going to the White House to work and you don't have a certain reverence for the the history of that, then you're in the wrong business. I mean, there is that that doesn't go away no matter how how long you do it. You're still aware of you know the that FDR was here and, uh, you know, so much happened uh, here uh, that I don't think you lose it. You just deal with it. I'm Alex. I'm with Cox Media Group. So speaking um, as someone from a TV bureau, I was just curious about the treatment of your story. Um, you know, it didn't happen for a few hours um, after you expected it to. I imagine you hadn't told people on purpose. Did they air it the next day? Was it something that aired that night? Um, Basically, as soon as the interview ended, what did you have to do after that? So the interview, let's, so it started at 6.15 p.m. and I had to go on TV at 6.30 um, because we were gonna do at least the first couple of hours with stations that were still doing newscasts, just do like a quick talk back and then go and put a package together for the late news. So we ended up doing um, just a talk back with a couple of stations, um, with stations that were able to cut a sot so we were able to put a sound bite together. Um, but for the evening, for the later newscasts, like your 10 and 11 o'clock, we did live shots with the package. And then the following morning, we did live shots with the, with the package as well. So we, we were able to air it that night because that was also the key thing. I was like, oh, it's getting late. Not very many people are going to take this interview. People aren't even doing news at this time. But we were able to like, keep communicating with the stations to hold their interest. And given that it was the president, they were able to, you know, find a find time for him in their shows. All 115 stations? <laughs> I, I don't know exactly which state. I think so, but I don't know exactly which stations. But a lot of our bigger stations did, like our New York, L.A., San Francisco, um, all of our stations in Texas, because um, they love politics. So. Quisi from PolitFact. Um, how are you massaging your um, relationship with the person that got you that interview so that you can possibly get another one? 
I'm still reaching out to him, uh, not ev not once a month, probably like um, maybe every other month. Um, things are not, it's not going well. It's actually, <laughs> it's, it's actually a campaign year. <laughs> yeah, it's actually on the decline um, right now. Uh, and I'm not sure he essentially, I reached out back in December and he was telling me that, you know, the president's busy. They're not going to have any time, maybe something uh, after the first of the year but we are getting into the election season, which you would think that that would be even more of an encouragement to do interviews, to kind of get your message out there because um, you know, you'll hear from critics of the administration that they're not doing a good job of getting the message out. And so that's where we come into play. Hopefully they'll call us and say, hey, we'd like to talk to you about you know, our plans and what we've gotten accomplished. So I'm still working to massage that relationship, but I don't think it's going well right now and it could just be there's a lot going on but hopefully now that the special counsel investigation regarding the documents has now wrapped up that's sort of you know not so much of a blunder um so maybe that um maybe i'll get a call soon but i just learned today that the president isn't doing a traditional super bowl right interview. right he didn't do it last year with fox and he's not doing it this year with cbs uh, uh, that's that's a hell of a big audience that he's uh, he's turning down, and there's a lot of criticism of it. Yeah. So if they're turning down CBS, there's no way they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna talk to me. Um, one last one. Um, when you're interviewing with six people, um, do you coordinate uh, beforehand? Do you share questions? Um, in what order do you go? Like, just how does it really? Um, <clears throat> you don't really. Uh, we, I mean, I've been in a lot of group <clears throat> interviews, and we've never gotten together beforehand and uh, and talked about that. And it's, you know, the, the the first question usually is sort of dictated by the seating arrangement. I mean, in the group one I did with Reagan, Carl Lubsdorf of the Dallas Morning News was in the seat right next to Reagan, so he asked the uh, the first one. And and you don't hog it. I mean, you ask your question, you ask Apollo. 30 minutes with six reporters, you're not going to get a second uh, second round. But we were able to, to cover all the, uh, the major topics of the day. The sort of focus of that one was Nicaragua and, and the Sandinistas, because that was the big story of the day. But we, we, we got in what we wanted. It, it, it's, it's funny that it, it's not a problem. It, it tends to work out. Hi, I'm Valerie from CQ Roll Call. Um, I just was curious about um, why you think Joe Biden may or might be giving less interviews um, than previous presidents. Uh, they are, you know, staff always is protective, and they're incredibly protective of, uh, of the president, of this president. Uh, and it's not, it's not like, the, this president s said things that uh, that got him in trouble only b after he turned 80. Uh, I, I covered his 1988 presidential campaign, and he did the exact same thing. He he didn't he didn't uh, he walked uh, much more uh, like a young man in those days, but he made the same uh, verbal uh, uh, mistakes. Uh, so that's, that's not a function of age, that's Joe being Joe. Uh, but presidential staffs try to protect them. Uh, and uh, you're, you're definitely seeing that right now. Hi, I'm Gabby. Um, I'm with the Nevada Independent, yeah. so one of the regional outlets. Yay! Um, yeah, <laughs> and we, we've, in my newsroom, talked about, yeah, that sort of like decline in regional bureaus in D.C. and obviously uh, what you mentioned about the president giving less interviews. We are a swing state, so I feel like we're always hopeful mm -hmm. that, you know, maybe someday even the vice president or somebody will talk to us, but... Actually, the, the fact of, w of what state you report for, I would guarantee you'll get something. That's what we yeah. keep to, we're like, we're yeah. the only <clears throat> statewide outlet and one of the six states is going to be decided, but nothing yet. Better to be but, Pennsylvania for him, right, but, but right, uh, that's true. Uh, that is good. Uh, but yeah, is there any, in the rare occasions when you have seen in recent years a regional land of interview, is there any sort of things you think... Oh, absolutely, discuss, absolutely. Uh, uh, most presidents uh, try to do that. Obama was not good at that, but... Uh, uh, most of them.
try to do that. But the, the demise of, of regional bureaus, the first foreign trip that I took with the president was uh, November of 83 to uh, South Korea and Japan. And there were 23 newspapers in the print rotation. The, the, uh, you all know what the, the pool is. I assume. Uh, the pool rotation had 23 newspapers in it. I think nine of those newspapers don't even exist. Uh, today. And if you look at the briefing room chart in 83, it was, it was mo mostly news, regional newspapers. Now there's uh, maybe three. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a problem. Yeah. Um, you guys talked to um, Andy Picone with E&E &E News and Politico. Um, you've talked about how the president and his staff often try to, you know, they're very kind of controlling of the situation. Have you, there ever been situations where they ask to see questions in advance or ask to approve questions? Not that you would necessarily allow that, but I'm curious about that level of control. I, I, I don't know about you, but in, in, the, in an interview with the president, I've, I've never gotten that. Uh, they, there have been questions, you know, you know, you only have eight minutes. Is there a, a subject? area that you're particularly interested in. And I, I don't have a problem with telling them, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the border. I mean, most of the interviews when I was with San Diego, we got a question in about the border because that was very important to us. So it wasn't giving away a secret to tell them that, you know, I'm going to ask. Uh, uh, or uh, telling them, uh, the, the other day I did let them know that I, I was going to. I was very interested in uh, in whether the president was ever going to respond to Governor Abbott and his moves on the border. But I didn't tell him a specific question. Uh, I've, I've never had a White House demand to know questions in advance. And just two points on that. Um, during my interview, they the press secretary did walk over maybe like an hour before the interview, just kind of wanted to pick my brain about the topics, but she didn't necessarily ask like what questions. She just wanted the topics to kind of, I guess, br get the president brushed up on them. That way, he could give the best answer possible. Um, but another instance, I had a colleague that interviewed the vice president last week, and the White House reached out and said. The vice president wants to talk about um, abortion and her nationwide tour that she's kicking off regarding reproductive rights. And they were like, we only want to talk about this, nothing else. And so, you know, that was a decision that had to be made for the reporter that did it. Um, you know, do you go off topic or do you stick to topic because you want more interviews? You don't want to, you know, upset anyone at the White House because having that access is important. Um, but the reporter did stick to, you know, the abortion topic that was discussed. But, um, yeah, they typically don't ask about the questions. They're more so interested in topics just to make sure that um, they can, I guess, fill the president in on various topics. Yeah, and there's a benefit to you also. It, you want to get something out of it. It doesn't do you any good to ask a question on a topic that they, they say, Oh, I'll have to get back to you on that. I, I, I don't know. I'm not up on that. You, you want them to be able to answer and move the story along. And our uh, favorite, if someone says, I'll circle back, but no one ever circles back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Jacob, speaking of regional outlets struggling. So I was the DC correspondent for a regional outlet that closed last month. So, uh, uh, which one? The Wyoming Truth, a, a nonprofit oh, based yeah. there. Uh, but also born and raised in San Diego and interned at the UT when I was in high school. Okay. So, love that. <laughs> um, my question is thinking about the difference between interviewing the president on the record for a formal interview and the opportunities to speak to him OTR at, when he comes back to the cabin in Air Force One or, or sort of in more yeah. informal contexts and how you think about those differently, what the role of that, those off the record conversations okay. are. Well, yeah, you do use them differently. I, I was at a, uh, a lunch with uh, President Obama. And it was off the record, uh, but it was very useful to me uh, because I pressed him on free trade, which was what we all wanted to know what he was going to do on free trade because he hadn't been really clear in the campaign. Uh, and I was able to come out of that knowing exactly 
what his timetable was, what he was thinking. And while I could not quote the president as saying that, I certainly could write a story that was well informed because the president himself had told me. Although some presidents, that's not a safe source. Uh, president Johnson once famously called the reporter and told him, I'm going to uh, not uh, reappoint J. Edgar Hoover as head of the FBI. The reporter, figuring the president was a pretty good source, reported that only to have the next day the president reappoint. Uh, so he, he just wanted to stick it to, to that reporter. So I, but Johnson's not around, and I tend to think the president's probably a good source as to uh, his, his thinking. Now, the other one that was weird, Bill Clinton, when he came back on a foreign trip, wanted to get his body as fast as possible onto uh, Eastern time. So he would try not to sleep, and he would wear out his staff playing hearts, and they'd want to go to sleep, and he'd come back to the press cabin where we were trying to sleep, and he'd spend a couple of hours there, you know, slumped on the floor, just talking to us about movies and so on. And the press secretary, Mike McCurry, didn't want us to really quote him because he was, God knows what he'd say in just an hour conversation. So he tried to claim that that wasn't really background, it was psych background <laughs> to give us a better sense of what the president was thinking and the state of his thinking. So and the psych background didn't last long. But uh, uh, so they're all different ways of, of, of doing that. Kwesi again from PolitiFact. Um, during a presidential campaign, um, there are people in the White House and the campaign headquarters as well. How do you, if you're trying to get a, an interview with the president, which side are you mostly talking to? White uh, House. White House. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the campaign can weigh in. It doesn't hurt to have them backing you. But they're, they're going to look at things. As I said, it doesn't matter you know, how great you are. It's can you help them? And so being from Nevada, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, used to be Ohio. Uh, I, I, I am from Ohio and, and worked for the Plain Dealer for years, and we really benefited with interviews when Ohio was the critical state. Now Ohio is a red state, so they don't get any, any interviews or anything. But uh, it's good to be Pennsylvania, Michigan. Okay, I think unfortunately we've come to the end of the line, uh, but this has been enormously instructive and also fun. And we really appreciate you all being here and, and sharing your experience with us. Thanks so much. Thank you.